you, Dr. Marion, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be before you today to discuss a topic that I think is uh, very relevant. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get to it. So we spend a good amount of our lives uh, training to become uh, physicians. I remember the excitement when we first got our short white coats and uh, I saw the joy in the families of, the, uh, of my co-medical students. My parents couldn't be there, they were in Nigeria, but I could feel their excitement from uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, after, sometimes we uh, had fun in medical school, but for the most part, it was a lot of hard work. After medical school, we end up uh, matriculating in an excellent place, such as Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, <coughs> this is just a picture that we take after the app site, and you can see some of our old and current residents. Um, we've lost some of these residents to uh, other specialties, radiology to be specific, I wonder why, but um, we all look forward to coming from the top of the stairs and ending up beside Dr. Davino and, <laughs> and Dr. Marin. And then after that, we practice medicine for, or surgery for a long part of our lives. Um, a lot of us stay in the field for a long time. Some of us don't really retire. We stay and continue to train the next generation of uh, residents and medical students. And you can interpret this as a passion for our, for our field, a passion for medicine, a passion for surgery. Um, and I'm sure we're all excited about this great field that we've chosen. But despite this, literature is filled with um, talks about how there's uh, stress and depression in doctors. This is from Australia, and everyone can read this as uh, as well as I can, and it talks about how the rate of depression in doctors and medical students is over four times higher um, than that of the general population. It also talks about how we work longer hours and uh, seek different methods of coping, including uh, alcohol for uh, uh, burnout. But this is not unique to Australia. This is uh, from UST where they had a s symposium talking about workload stress, relationship and, and emotional problems, and various addictions in medical students and doctors. Uh, there's also, so then you wonder, why would anyone choose to become a doctor? And this is actually a, a title straight off uh, a New York Times article uh, by Danielle Ofri, who's a, a physician at Bellevue. And she talked about how uh, doctors actually tend to discourage other people, including medical students, from joining the field of medicine. And you wonder why. And there are many uh, comments on the, um, article that talk about, you know, why we chose to become doctors, why we stay in the field, and how we cope uh, with um, our daily stresses. So coming to Sinai, our statistics here are actually better, so I'm pleased to present that. Um, this is a survey of residents and medical students, and you can see um, that of our <coughs> residents, up to 43% have thought about quitting medicine now or sometime in the past. Um, even higher in our medical students, 54%. Um, in terms of suicide, 9% of the residents have thought about it in the past. Not, not had uh, an actual plan, but uh, considered it. And much better in our medical students, 0%. Um, in terms of our expectations going into medicine, 46% of the residents think that in retrospect, uh, what they got into is different from what they were expecting, and 70% of our medical students, which is even higher. But despite these second thoughts, um, despite these second thoughts, 96% of the residents say that if given a chance, they would choose to go into medicine again, and 100% of our medical students say they will go into medicine again. And uh, just something, I found it hard to believe the last statistic, but <laughs> the fact that it matches both residents and medical students probably lends credence to it. 83% of us think that if we won the lottery, we would still remain in medicine. Uh, someone was uh, kind enough to say they would remain in medicine but work less. And a number of people said they, they would just quit altogether and not work at all. I believe those people. So, <laughs> so why the transformation from eager medical student to depressed physician, depressed attending, depressed resident? 
I think that's an important, um, important question to go over. So when asked to um, come up with objectives for, for this talk when I was turning in my physician form, uh, these are the two things that I came up with. To identify typical stressors in the life of a physician or surgeon, and to identify and practice personalized coping strategies. And the emphasis is on personalized because what works for me may not work for you. And throughout this presentation, you see that the examples are actually things I've learned from my co-residents, from my attendings. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't have a magic formula that's going to make your life all better. I'm from Nigeria, but I don't have any uh, African juju that's going to help either. Um, but before you dismiss the ideas that are about to come to you, I thought this was an interesting quote. It's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So whether or not you accept the ideas on how to cope with stress today, I hope you at least entertain them. So I arranged this in a temporal manner, going from before medical school to medical school residency and even stress as an attending. And we'll talk about coping strategies at each level. So before medical school, what inspired our decision to become physicians? Is it family or prestige? So you may have come from a family of doctors, um, and you may have been inspired by a parent uh, to join the field. Or you may have come from a family like mine where, we, uh, where everything was diagnosed as malaria, and we um, soaked some nearby herbs in alcohol and used that as uh, medicine. Um, I remember uh, telling my mom that I wanted to become a musician, and I had this innocent picture in mind, but she probably had something worse <laughs> in her mind and said, absolutely not. So here I am. Of course, I didn't tell Dr. DeVino that I wanted to do music instead of medicine, but <laughs> that may not have worked out very well. Uh, what are the other reasons people cite for why we go into medicine? There's money or the financial reward. And then you think about it, how much do we really make? Um, and it depends on where you look. Uh, there are different numbers in different, different places, but what most people see as the public when you go to Wikipedia or Google are these figures. So an anesthesiologist, pretty up there, 400. Cardiology, 500. Derm, family medicine on the lower side. GI uh, on the higher side. Hospitalists, pediatricians, super low. Um, and then general surgeons, uh, I guess depending on what part of the country you work in. If you're obviously in the Midwest or in the middle of nowhere, that, that amount might be double. Not to inspire anyone to leave. <laughs> there is also the idea of contribution to humanity. Um, you know, a number of us came in thinking, well, we want to help everyone. We want to make a difference. We want to save a life. There's also bringing compassion into medicine. You may have had uh, a family member that had a severe um, illness, and you, you may not have liked the way the doctors presented it to you, and you thought you would be a better, uh, more compassionate person uh, to practice medicine. Or some of us went in because we did so well in school. We had all A's. Everyone told us we were awesome, and you know that was the next step to become uh, physicians. There's also the awe of discovering the human body. I remember doing an open case recently on Sir Junk, where the incisions tend to be bigger than most uh, other uh, services for good reasons. And the medical student was so inspired by just the peristalsis of the small bowel. And I remember at some point that may have been exciting for some of us, and now we're just jaded. Um, <laughs> some people uh, think about destiny. I think I, I was uh, speaking with one of our residents and I asked him, and I won't mention his name, I asked uh, why he went into medicine, and uh, he said, uh, well, it just seemed like a worthwhile thing to do. So I'm going to interpret that as destiny. <laughs> um, some of us decide later we are dissatisfied with a different field of medicine, a field of uh, a different career, and we switch and come into medicine. Some of us are excited by the uh, idea of lifelong learning. But after all that, we end up in medical school and there's a bunch of stressors. One of those is family time, that your family that you know, encouraged you and inspired you and told you you were awesome and you had all A's to go into medical school starts to wonder why you're not returning their <coughs> phone calls, um, why you're not available for Thanksgiving or whatever else, and you're trying to manage family time. There's also the stress of per perpetual exams. I remember uh, at Howard, we had exams every two weeks. So by the time you got your grade from one exam, 
whether he did well or not, you, you just had enough time to recover and start studying for the next one. And uh, <coughs> we found that pretty stressful. There's also a uh, failure. Some of us, uh, you know, medical school will probably be the first time we've ever failed at anything. Uh, and that is not usual for us. There's also sleep deprivation. So how do we cope with, uh, you know, I think one of the coping strategies is time management. Um, and this is probably a no-brainer to most of us, but, you know, putting things on your calendar, mm -hmm. putting them right in front of you at your work desk so that it's always in front of you, you know what you're looking forward to, you're sort of planning. Um, To-do lists, I know as interns, we were all taught to make the check boxes so that, to make sure that everything got done. Uh, there's also the concept of power breaks, and I learned this uh, when I was in medical school studying for step one. Um, you know, it's a long exam. I don't know if it's seven or eight hours now, but um, you had to manage your own time in terms of breaks in between 50-minute uh, blocks. And uh, we had Kaplan, I believe, come uh, teach us, and they taught us to do 50-10, so 50 minutes of um, teaching and a 10 minute break and we would come back 15 minutes of teaching 10 minute break and it made it sort of routine for us so we could apply that to our exams but even after doing doing that in class uh, extended that and did that at home so I would wake up 10 minutes for a shower and then I would study for 15 minutes 10 minutes to use lotion and then study for 15 minutes <laughs> 10 minutes to dress up study for 50 minutes 10 minutes to call my family study for 50 minutes and it ended up being uh, a great way to study so I recommend that for any stressful exams you have coming up. Um, obviously, don't wait till the last minute. Work ahead of deadlines. Set small, achievable goals. Uh, most of these are no-brainers, but I think it's important to um, remind ourselves when you know, a task might seem unachievable or huge, but when you break it down into small, achievable goals and things you can accomplish on a daily basis, it becomes easier to manage and also less stressful. What about the concept of failure? Um, so in general, failure is a part of life. It's not unique to medicine. It's, it's everywhere you go, everything you choose to do, there is the concept uh, of failure. But before you call yourself or your situation a failure, I think there are certain things that um, you should look at. One is to know yourself. What are your goals? What are the things that you want to accomplish? You know, some, for some people, 80% 80, 80 is a good grade. For others, they've never had that in their, in their lives. They've always been in the 90s. So I think it's important to know what, what, your, what your strengths are and then compete with yourself. So don't be upset because your neighbor had 92 and you had 90. If you study the best you could and 90 was the grade you could get, then that's awesome. Um, and after you compete with yourself, surpass yourself. So in other words, don't be complacent. I remember um, my father was a smart man. He uh, placed um, his, uh, there was this exam called SSE that we took after um, senior secondary school and he placed his results on our, on our door, uh, me and my brothers. And so we would see that every day going into our rooms, our father's A's, and it sort of gave you the sense that it's in you, you can do it. You can accomplish the same thing. So. If you've done it in the past, you've made it this far, remind yourself that it's something you can do and that could uh, edge you on in uh, you know, studying, working on a presentation, working on research, whatever it is you need to do. Um, and obviously, if you, if you fail at something, get up and uh, try again and maybe you end up with success instead. Next is sleep deprivation. Um, I think that's something we all struggle with. Uh, you know, there's limited time to sleep. I think one of the things you need to do is take power naps. Uh, even if it's 10 minutes before, you know, your resident is, your chief resident is coming from the OR to round with you on vascular, and you have those 10 minutes, please take a power nap. And when you actually sleep, sleep well. Um, I remember when I moved into my uh, apartment uh, four and a half years ago, my doorman said, you know, people are gonna be giving out a lot of things a lot of furniture, TVs, things like that. Make sure to accept them, but make sure to buy your own bed because he realized, uh, he understood that sleep was uh, essential. So this is from Princeton. Uh, it talks about sleep hygiene. hygiene. Um, obviously, don't go to bed hungry or too full. Um, sometimes we get home super late, it's 10 o'clock, and the big decision for the day is whether to eat or to sleep. Um, if you find yourself in that situation, obviously, uh, a good idea is probably to take a small snack. So don't eat, you know, a pizza and a Coke at that time, but 
uh, something light so that you're neither hungry nor too full. Um, get regular exercise, and they recommended to do this before 3 p.m. Um, so that you're not all wound up right before sleeping. They also recommended using the bed only for sleep or sex, and that is from Princeton University. Um, create the right environment. So, you know, it should be dark, it should be quiet. Um, you shouldn't have uh, all sorts of things that would distract you or keep you up or interfere with your sleep cycle. If you have to nap, which I strongly recommend, do that before 3 p.m. and less, uh, let it be for less than an hour. Reduce stress. I mean, this is obviously easier said than done, but that's what you know this whole uh, talk is about. And one of the things they recommended is if you're about to sleep and you find that you have a lot to do, your to-do list is uh, overwhelming, but you know it's definitely time for you to sleep. You should try to rearrange that to-do list for the days to come, so that you sleep with a sense of a sense of calm that you're going to be able to accomplish those things the next day. So you actually spend that time resting because you don't want to be contemplating all the things you need to do and actually dreaming about them, having nightmares instead of getting uh, rest. They also recommended drinking milk. It helps with sleep. Taking a warm shower or bath before sleeping. Setting your body clock is sort of difficult for us because we have different conferences on different days and our days start differently every day, so it's hard to, to do that. They recommended deep breathing and visualization, actually, and I, I thought this was important because uh, we, before our patients go to sleep for surgery, we always talk about, oh, well, where are you going for your next vacation? Think of a happy place. Um, well, that's something you can also do every day right before you go to sleep, and it's, uh, it's part of sleep hygiene, and it uh, enhances your rest. Avoid alcohol or caffeine uh, close to sleep time. So now we're in residency and we have different things that stress us as residents. And some of these are actually from uh, Sinai residents. So we'll talk about them one by one. There's the problem of compliance. Um, we all know the rules, 80 hour work week, 16 hour shifts for interns, 27 hour days for the rest of us, um, and 10 hours off between shifts. Between shifts. And it's, it's difficult to accomplish this. I mean, I know our attendings talk about how they're Work weeks used to be longer than hours, but I think in order to accomplish compliance, we end up taking work home. You know, you're that intern, uh, the only intern on surgical oncology, and you're updating the list from home, even though you're off the clock. You're calling the, you know, PA to tell them what labs to order for the next day. Um, and you have a presentation to give the day after. There's always something that takes that extra time that you're spending off the clock, and it ends up not really being, uh, truly compliant. Um, so what are the coping strategies? We, we already talked about time management techniques. I think, you know, as surgical residents, we spend a lot of time waiting. There's waiting for the OR, waiting for equipment, waiting for nursing staff, waiting for anesthesia. Those are times where you can work on your presentations, do your dictations, log your cases, new innovations, all the things that Eric bug bugs us about. Um, in the same way you schedule work, you should also schedule play. So. You can, you know, on that your one day off per week, um, you know, schedule your sleep time, schedule your movie, schedule some time for your presentation such that you accomplish both recreation and continue uh, to be efficient. Um, also, long-term goals and short-term goals, we talked about um, breaking things down so that they seem uh, more manageable. And then there's the idea of life-work <coughs> balance. I think uh, for everyone, this is important to make a list. And we'll refer to this list later. But in addition to medicine, what other things do you like to do? Do you like to dance? Do you like to play soccer? Do you like to swim? Whatever it is you like to do, try to incorporate those things into your recreation time so that you don't feel that you're absolutely absorbed by this responsibility to other people, but you have some time and spend some time rejuvenating yourself. Um, and mix and work and play. I have some uh, Sinai examples of mix and work and play. So I recently came off uh, Team 4, and all I could hear of was uh, Dr. Chin's uh, marathon. It was coming up, uh, I think, in May, a Brooklyn marathon. And he actually got a number of residents to sign up. And I think this is beneficial. A good number of them have been uh, running together um, to get ready for this marathon. And you know, we all know the the psychology of exercise and how that increases uh, endorphins and is also in general good for your health. I mean, if you're in good health, you're always happier and less stressed. Um, and then on team three, we have Fridays with uh, Dr. Kinney. So 
we always uh, somehow, the chief residents somehow end up in Dr. Kinney's room and I, you know, he's an excellent surgeon, he's great to learn from, but the real secret is that we come, we come for the music. <laughs> There's also hanging out with uh, your co-residents, so this is a picture from a wedding and everyone can recognize Payam smack in the front. Uh, if I leave this picture long enough, you recognize some other people that you know some of whom did a solo at some point in this performance. Um, and remember that exam that we all struggle to get ready for every year. Um, a good number of us were, <laughs> were getting ready <laughs> for this. Uh, for this, um, this is what we did this year. Sorry to put it out there, but it was a lot of fun and it was good stress relief after taking that one exam that stresses us out all year, and I think it should become, uh, it should become a Sinai tradition, post upside karaoke. And in case you can't recognize her, we're singing uh, Celine Dion here. <laughs> and you know, there are other examples from other attendings. I didn't, you know, I didn't include everything, but you know, there's uh, operating with Dr. Heron, he plays old school hip hop, which, which can actually be relaxing, believe it or not. There's also transitioning to new responsibilities. So you've survived medical school, now you're an intern, and people expect you to know things, people expect you to do things. Your to-do list is, has skyrocketed all of a sudden, and it could be stressful. There's going from an intern to a junior resident, now you're that console resident that has to see patients. You're the first to evaluate everything, and you keep wondering, doubting yourself, what else can I do, how can I be more efficient? And then you survived ER consult, now you're a senior resident, and you have to do that every day, overnight, uh, Q three to four days. Um, you know, you have to evaluate patients. You're the only surgical resident in house. Um, you find out something, you think it's important. It's 1 a.m. Do you tell the attending? Do you not? Which one is going to yell at you? Which one is going to be happy that they were informed? Um, you decide it's important. You call them, they yell at you. You decide it's not important. The next morning, they're upset that they don't know about it. And you're damned if you do or damned if you don't. There's also transition in from senior to uh, chief resident, and we're dealing with uh, interviews, managing services from across the country, looking for case coverage from across the country. Um, even though it's a great time, the attendings treat you differently, you're operating, it's awesome. And we all love being chief residents. There's also transition in from chief resident to fellow, fellow to attending. There's also the stress of transition into new places. So you, your family's in California, but you matched in New York. You've moved from warm weather to snow every day. You're away from your family. Uh, now your relationship of five years is now long distance. You had social groups, religious groups, whatever type of groups you were part of that sort of served as your support system and now you don't have those anymore. And those are things that could all serve as stressors. One that I thought was important, also this I got from a co-resident, is amorphous feedback and unclear expectations. Um, especially with the interns. Um, it's, it seems like they, they're more, they really want to know, you know how they're doing. It's their first year. Um, they're eager to please. They have this to-do list you've given them, and it's important to let them know um, how they're doing. Don't just say, oh, you're doing a great job. Or don't just say you suck, but give them the specific things they're doing well and how they can improve. There's also the question of unclear expectations and people not necessarily being sure what else is expected of them. Um, so some of the coping strategies for that is setting expectations for yourself. Um, what do you think you should be accomplishing? I remember when we, when, when I got on, whenever I, I started a vascular rotation, Dr. Elozi would ask me, well, Alara, what are you expecting out of, this, out of this rotation? And I think it's important to think about that and have that in mind so that you're actually accomplishing those things and uh, having a meaningful experience from different rotations, whether or not that's what you're going into. Um, there's also the goals and objectives on new innovations. I thought I would just plug that in. Um, chiefs and seniors, it's important to communicate your expectations to junior residents, also attendings, um, to communicate expectations to the rest of us. Feedback should be concrete, um, not amorphous. Uh, positive feedback is equally important. I find that for the most part, you, you know, as an intern, you only find out about that one thing that you didn't do when there was that list of 25 things where you accomplished 24. I think it's important to uh, give positive reinforcement for, for the things that are actually done well. I think it's encouraging uh, for the interns and 
you know, obviously the rest of us as residents. And be constructive, not critical. So don't just tell people what they did wrong, but offer a suggestion for how to improve. Uh, give them a sense of uh, sympathy. You went through the same thing. This is how you handled it. I think that's uh, very important for our junior residents. And feedback should be timely so that they can apply it to the actual situation and understand, um, understand what you're referring to. There's also the question of finances. A good number of us are in debt, and I wonder sometimes if that's why um, it's one of the reasons people stay in medicine. By the time they realize that they want to quit, they're so far in debt um, that they decide it's probably a better uh, financial decision to keep going. Um, in terms of coping, you know, there's the idea of savings. Try to put something away every month, every paycheck um, for that rainy day. Uh, there are financial planning advisors that can help with paying loans. Um, get married. There are a number of uh, interns that I've <laughs> related with, and a good number of them are married to people in different fields that sort of serve as sugar, sugar mummies and sugar daddies, and finances are not part of their, <laughs> part of their stresses. And it may seem funny, but it definitely works for some of us. Um, limit credit card. Uh, purchases. I personally don't have a credit card. If you swipe my debit card and it can't, uh, it can't afford whatever it is I'm trying to buy, then it's not something that I need at the at the moment. Um, but obviously, there are people that can help help you with debt, help you consolidate and uh, make uh, repayment plans. And it also helps to live within your means. Um, it's good to aspire towards uh, the good things of life, and they will come in time. Um, but living within your means helps uh, to decrease stress. Now our attendings, what stresses them? We've made it past residency. Um, and these are some of the things that our attendings have to deal with. Some are the same as ours and others are different. Uh, so there's the idea of uh, time constraints. Now they have even more things to do. They have to dictate, they have to see the patient pre-op, post-op, make sure that their staff is taking care of um, business and getting things going for the patients and the time management strategies end up being the same. While you're waiting, do all those extra things that you need to do. If it's a clinic note that you need to finish up uh, or whatnot, every moment counts. Um, and then use your resources. So, you know, we, we're residents, we're here to help you. Uh, we help with dictations. Give us some feedback on what the dictations, what we're doing with, wrong with our dictations or what we're doing right so that you have, you, you need less time to go over what we dictated for you and anticipate what you need. I think this is a no-brainer, but you know, sometimes in the OR you, you need a certain instrument or you need a certain suture and you don't tell the staff in time and you end up with uh, a scrub tech or a nurse that's not on the brighter side. And I think I've seen that be a real um, source of stress for most of our attendings when they're waiting for a thing that has to, they're in Annenberg and the thing has to come all the way from GP because wasn't anticipated and you expect every standard place to have those things because they should, but you know, just anticipating and sort of working with uh, the people around us. There's also the problem of uh, complications. Um, the first one, be careful. I mean, I just had to put that there. Move slow to move fast. So, you know, they're, we're all, all our attendings are, you know, excellent. We all do a great job, uh, but there are certain parts of certain operations that end up being the most dangerous, the most difficult, the parts where you're most likely to make a mistake or most likely uh, to do something that's harmful to the patient, that's the time to slow down, to move fast. Because if you botch it the first time, you have to do it again. If you don't like the way your anastomosis looks, you have to do it again. So at the end of the day, you're not really saving time, you're losing time. So that might be the time to slow down and uh, do things um, carefully. There's also the idea of healthy uh, paranoia. Always rule out the worst. Complications that I picked up early um, obviously have the better outcomes. So, you know, if the patient uh, doesn't look right, if the patient is not, one of the things one of my attendings told me, and I can't remember which one it is, but if a patient is not following your expected course after the procedure that you did, then you should be worried that something else is going on, even if they don't look particularly sick. Um, so that's when we do all the CT angios and add the abdomen pelvis at the same time, just because the patient is down there and find out what's going on. There's also dealing with patient and family expectations when you have complications. I think that could be pretty uh, difficult. There are some families that are more difficult to deal with than others. There's also the concept of delivering bad news, and I think it helps to manage the patient and family expectations preemptively. So even before the surgery, talk about what are the possibilities, what are the things you expect, 
how the patient will do if they're doing absolutely well, how they would do if they're not doing so great, because sometimes the family members are the ones that pick up that the patients aren't doing so well. It might not be the nurse, it might not be the residents. If, so if they're educated and they sort of have the right expectations about normal versus abnormal uh, pre and post up, they can help. Also don't overstate or understate the situation. So you know, if there's a complication that's fatal, um, or if you're taking a patient back to the OR and you don't think they're gonna make it, it's helpful to sort of prepare the family for that so that they can you know, call whoever they need to call, bring people from out of town, sort of have that uh, moment that they can spend uh, with the patient and it definitely helps. Moral support, take a resident with you to go talk to the family, take a medical student, someone else, sort of give you some backing so you're not the only one talking to, you know, 10 family members. Um, and it's important to actually deal with whatever it is personally before approaching the family. You don't want to be having the same, you know, mental breakdown that the family is having. That doesn't uh, instill confidence. Um, and then our friends in palliative care are also always helpful with, uh, you know, end of life care and uh, pain management and sort of dealing with the families. So we talked about time constraints, complications, dealing with bad news, difficult family members, sleep deprivation, same for uh, residents, medical students, and uh, attendings. Um, there's also, I don't know if this is a problem, but um, you know, I think we should all have high expectations, but be flexible and uh, realize that people have different strengths and weaknesses and be willing to accommodate those and em emphasize people's strengths, uh, but also give them a way to work on their weaknesses so that at the end of the day, they can all work for you. Um, so in summary, take bar breaks, eat, sleep, exercise, ask for help, relax, refresh yourself. And if you didn't get that in words, eat. <laughs> Sleep, <laughs> exercise, ask for help, relax, refresh. And just that list that I referred to earlier, you know, what else makes me tick? What else is there to, to who I am? And make sure those things are included in your, in your daily lives. Um, set expectations for yourself, meet them, exceed them, never be complacent. And if, uh, if there's any message that I want to send today is that every single one of us is stressed. So don't escalate the problem. Don't, don't transfer your stresses to, to, the, to everyone else. And I just had to end with a picture of Dr. Steinhagen dealing with what otherwise could have been a stressful situation. We were <laughs> disinfecting a patient and uh, he got some stool in his scripts. <laughs> and Sam is learning how to, how to deal with <laughs> similar situations. That's it. <laughs>